How we do in English 1102 class? This is Professor Boston. It is week uh, uh, two of self quarantine and self isolation. Um, I'm starting to uh, lose track of time. My eating habits are getting a little weird. Um, I haven't talked to anyone really in a long time, and I now I have this. Don't worry about that. Uh, this is a video series that only focuses on happy things, not the inevitable apocalypse and our own doom. And so I wanted to start today's video lesson by telling you a little story. The year is 2008. Crocs are in, highlights are in, No One by Alicia Keys just dropped, and it was one of 25 songs I had on my iPod Touch that I obtained legally, would never use LimeWire. And I had a teacher by the name of Miss Freeman, the Freeman Demon. Now I'm just kidding, that last part we all added in, but her, her real name was Miss Freeman. Now, I was taking her class, I was a little seventh grader, uh, I was awkward, and uh, in this class I was kind of a loner by myself and she assigned us a research project. Um, it was to go read a book and to write a quick one-page review about it. And me, being a savvy little 13-year-old, thought, I'm not going to read this f***ing book. You know, I'm not going to do this. i got to play video games. i gotta, I got to catch up with Spider-Man 2. i got to catch up with um, Madden 07. I got, you know, I've got all these important things I have to do when I get home. Clearly, I don't have time to read in a 100-page book. So I go home, I type in the, the title of the book, which I don't remember because I didn't read it, uh, and I type in spark notes and synopsis. And I copy and paste everything they say, plop it in to a Word document, and then I come back the next day and submit it to Miss Freeman. Um, towards the end of class, when everyone left, she called me up and she said, Kelly, I really like this work. Um, it's very insightful. You did a good job. I think you're a future English teacher. I don't know, maybe she's right. But she said, there's one problem. I think you might have... <laughs> that was pretty accurate. That's kind of what she sounded like. And I remembered for the rest of my academic career how awful it is to be the person that plagiarizes. Now, no one plagiarizes really anymore intentionally, unless you were me in seventh grade. A lot of the times it's accidental. And today we're gonna to be talking about how to avoid that. Now, you know how to write references, but in-text citations are the best way to signal to your reader that the ideas you're writing about are not yours, okay? Now, before we do that, I do need to make a couple of announcements. First of all, um, this is concerning the final project. Now, I know uh, last week I posted on D2L and said that it would be optional. I do want to clarify what I mean. Now, the final case study is due with about three weeks left till the end of the semester. It's going to take me about a week to grade it, which means you're going to get it back with two weeks left in the semester, okay? You have really two options. You can take the grade um, that I receive, that I give back to you, and you can say, this is a good grade, I'm gonna keep it, and you can use that grade towards your actual final project. Now remember, the case study is 30%, the final project is 15%. You do this, kind of combine them together, and that's gonna take 45% of your grade as one single grade. So if you do well on the case study, you can call it a day, and you can have a good time. Excuse me, I gotta stop drinking LaCroix. And um, that can be it. But if you don't like the grade on your case study, it's not that easy. Now I am gonna offer revision, like I said, um, so you can revise the case study once you get it back. You'll have about a week to do so. Um, but you cannot use the revised grade to substitute your final grade, okay? What you can do um, is one of two options, and I will post about this later with more details, but I just wanted to give everyone a heads up. You can make a video essay, kind of like what I'm doing here, except you don't have to have crazy editing skills, about the case study that you wrote about. Um, it has to be about 10 minutes long, and you can just present what you would have normally presented had COVID-19 not upended the entire KSU experience. The other option is you can write about COVID-19. 
I'm not a big fan of narrative essays, but considering circumstances, um, I think it's a good opportunity. So uh, the other option, in which I will give way more details about as we get closer, is a three to four page paper detailing your experience with the COVID-19 uh, isolation, okay? Now there is one other announcement that I do need to make. Uh, I, I wanna send a message out to XX Flick of the Wrist 96. Um, go f yourself. Yeah. And uh, let's just get back to what we're talking about today, which was in-text citations. Come a little closer. Do I'm going to stay over other? here by Joni. Do they know each other? They... No, hold him tight. Hold him tight. Hold him tight. I am. I am. Hold him tight. I am. I am. You got it. I am. Oh, it's okay. All right. All right, Joni, you got it. Oh, well. So, as I was brainstorming the second part of this video series, I thought, I need to find a good definition of in-text citations um, because I think students sometimes learn better if it's not coming from me, if it's coming from some official source. So I started parsing through uh, what teaching textbooks I had. I was looking through all of these books, couldn't really find anything that great. And in the process of looking, I realized that I made tacos last night and I was kind of hungry. So I went to the kitchen, made some tacos, uh, definitely had some ground beef, some peppers and onions. Uh, put a little bit of salsa on there, crumbled up some cheese, uh, and then I wrapped it up, went over to my Lazy Boy recliner, uh, leaned back, and started watching Spongebob. I ate the entire burrito that I had just made before I realized I was still lacking a good definition for in-text citations. So I got up, went to my computer, and I typed in, what is an in-text citation? Always a good start, am I right? So, what Google told me, and I think it's probably the best generalized definition is that an in-text citation alerts the reader to a source you are pulling info from. It tells the reader one, this is not my idea so please don't sue me and two, here's where you can find that idea and please don't sue me. Okay, uh, In America, in um, Europe, uh, not really so much in Asian countries, uh, culturally we value individualism and we have very strict copyright and plagiarism laws. Um, Let's just say, for example, uh, your name is Francis S. Thompson, the third uh, descendant of Francis S. Thompson Sr. the second, okay? You've been working your whole life on, I don't know, let's say you're an, uh, an expert on all things anteater. You've been working your whole life on an anteater essay. You're 60 years old. You finally publish a book about anteaters that changes the way that researchers and ant eaters understand the animal. That's right, Tracy. We're sitting down here with Dr. Franklin Kearns. Uh, he has just published the definitive book on ant eaters, a complete anatomy, behavior, and history. Dr. Kearns, we're honored to have you join us on Today Now this morning. Thanks, Jim. Always a pleasure to be uh, actually conversing with another human. And next thing you know, 20 years later, some stupid little college freshman waltzes along and has to write some essay in some stupid college freshman class about what an anteater is. And they go to their library database and type in anteater research, find Francis S. Thompson III's essay, and they say, hey, there's some good shit in this. Um, I'm gonna use this in my essay. They use it in their essay, and guess what? They don't use an in-text citation. Now, for whatever reason, let's just say in a hypothetical world, this stupid college freshman um, wins some award for writing the best anteater essay, and people start citing this college freshman's work, even though they never cited the anteater Francis Thompson. Uh, I don't remember the name that I use. But you can see where I'm going with this, right? Um, the reason that we value in-text citations is because we want to give credit where credit's due. And even though we value plagiarism in this country, at, or I'm sorry, and even though plagiarism is frowned upon in this country, and um, some English professors take it a little too seriously, um, it's in place, our practices of in-text citations and copyright and plagiarism laws are there for a good reason. Um, so, there are three different ways that you can in-text cite a work, okay? But all of them in APA rely on what's called parenthetical citations. Now you've seen them before, you probably have used them if you've ever used MLA, imagine you have. Um, but basically, it is a parenthesis at the end of a sentence preceding the period 
And in this parentheses, at least in APA, there's three pieces of information that you need. Um, the author, our publication, our title of the work, mm -hmm. okay? Author first, mm -hmm. the year that it was published, mm -hmm. and a page number if you can find one. Mm -hmm. Now, all of those things will always be there in APA. Um, even if you're citing weird sources, like YouTube videos, for instance, um, they all, will, that is one consistent rule of APA, end of the sentence, parenthetical citation, preceding the period, every single time. However, when it comes to in-text citations themselves, when you're referencing a work, there are three different main approaches to how you can reference a work. Now the first is pretty obvious, it is called Direct quoting, and it is exactly what it sounds like. It's where I take something, some sentence, or some excerpt of this entire passage, put some in quotation marks on it, slap it into my essay, I say, look at what I found, isn't it great, and I use it to relate to my overall research, okay? That obviously, and you are all used to this from writing an MLA, will need parentheticals. I have this uh, Philosophy 101 book, and, um, you know, it's unimportant to this class, but I didn't want to use something that one of you would steal. I hate using examples that students think are free game for their essays. And I know none of you are going to be writing about the allegory of the cave. So really quick, I'm going to read an excerpt from this, um, and it's going to appear on the screen. There exists a cave where inside a group of prisoners have been locked up since birth. Okay, so this is the um, passage I'm going to be working with. You can supplement this with any source that you're using and kind of see how I'm making the same moves. Now, summary is a little different from paraphrasing, okay? Summary is just summarizing a source in your own words, but instead of summarizing a certain part of that source, you're summarizing the entirety or large, at least a large percentage of that source. So let's say I want to summarize the paragraph that I just read. I would say, the allegory of the cave talks about three prisoners chained up looking at shadows and it was written by Plato sometime a long time ago. I'm not going to look it up right now. Okay, That is a summary. Even in that situation, even though I'm not using quotation marks, even though I'm not paraphrasing, even though it's summarizing an entire paragraph in just a sentence or less, I still have to use a parenthetical citation. Okay, Let's talk about paraphrasing. So let's say I like the sentence, behind and above the prisoners is a fire and between the fire and the prisoners is a low wall where people walk carrying objects in their heads. So a paraphrase is essentially just changing the words of a sentence or two into your own words. When you do this, you don't have to put quotation marks around it, but you still need a parenthetical citation. So for example, I would say all around the prisoners was a fire and um, there was a wall where people could walk, and between the fire and the prisoners, those people walked and carried things on their heads. Now you see, I kind of used the same text in a similar way, but I changed it up, put it in my own words. I would still need parenthetical citation. Computer? Yes. Do we have any uh, new sequences? I have a beta sequence I've been working on. Would you like to see it? All right. So. Let's say you're getting a little annoyed because it distracts the reader every single sentence you have a parenthetical, and it can get a little annoying, okay? There's another method that you can use called signal phrasing. Signal phrasing still incorporates all three pieces of information that you use in a parenthetical citation, but it can take either the author, title, or publication identifying information and or the year it was published, and it puts them at the front of the sentence. So for example, Let's talk about my philosophy book again. Let's say, um, let's say I want to use a signal phrase to introduce a direct quote from this book. Now I know the author's name is Paul Kleinman. Kleinman. Okay. So a signal phrase just introduces again at the beginning of the sentence. It signals to the reader that this information is not from you. It's not your own idea. So I would say, according to Kleinman, comma, uh, 2000, uh, I don't know what year this is, um, comma, 2013, comma, 
blah, 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 blah. And then since I didn't include a page number, I end it with a parentheses and the page number. You see how, see how that works? If I was summarizing or, or paraphrasing, I might not necessarily need a page number, um, especially if I was summarizing. But for a direct quote, always get a page number if you can find one, okay? So let's say, for instance, you're using the same um, source for an entire paragraph and you're not jumping in between sources. So let's say you're writing a philosophy paper like my hypothetical example, and I'm writing for an entire page of my essay um, using Paul Kleinman's work as a source. The first time you introduce the author, as long as you are consistently following that source and not jumping between sources, all you have to cite at the end is page numbers. When you jump into a new paragraph though, you have to restate the first time that you cite that source, either with a signal phrase or with the author's last name, uh, title of the work, um, the publication, the year, all of that fun stuff that you would normally include again, okay? Now, um, just know that, that that changes between each paragraph, so try not to forget about that. I will mark it off in your essay, okay? So what I want you to do for today's activity is to pick one of your sources that you plan on using in your case study, copy two or three paragraphs out of this, and paste it onto a Word document. Then I want you to go to D2L, pull up in-class assignments, and follow the directions. Of course, if you have any questions, reach out to me. That's why I'm here. Um, but it should be pretty straightforward. Again, remember, I want all of you to vary between direct quotes, paraphrases, and summarizing in your actual case study. I don't want you to overload on just one, okay? Um,